Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Square Eye Syndrome Podcast. My name is Ben Gilman. As always, I'm joined by Tom Hill. Hey. And Dan Rudge. Hey, yeah. And unfortunately, we can't locate Troy, who's still stuck in the cupboard. We've lost the key, so he will have to be back next week. Um, this week is a change in plans. We've decided to do it in a normal syndrome episode because we have had difficulties getting to finish up. So next week will now be the special for Ashes to Ashes. So we do apologize, um, but please be, please wait for it. I do apologize. So how are you guys doing anyway? Yeah, yeah not too bad, right? Okay. Awesome. Good week. What about yourself? Uh, I can't. Well, I've had a better week this week. I've had good news at work. But we'll, keep, we'll keep it out of that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Tom knows what I'm talking about. Yes, I'm fully aware of what you're referring to. Yeah. That's, that's all I'm going to say. I've had a good week. Um, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's happy. Um, so, yeah, uh, this week. I think I've screwed myself. Um, Impressive. I've well, I've I've always been good at being a solo artist. Um, the, the biggest that um, okay, I was going to talk about my picks this week are going to be the thing, and then I realised there's two other shows attached to this. So this week I wanted to use my 15 minutes to talk about Daredevil, Jessica Jones. Iron Fist, Luke Cage, Defenders, Punisher. Yeah. Which is a mission. Because I forgot the Defenders was a thing. So, and I completely forgot about the Punisher. So I'm just going to go through them very briefly. Um, so there's Daredevil. These are all on Netflix. I don't know the status of these shows. And Disney Plus is up and running. Um, I don't know if Netflix will hold on to them forever. Does anybody know if they're safe? Because they are Netflix originals, but you know, I imagine, I imagine Jessica Jones is probably safe because that's definitely a Netflix original. And yeah. but Daredevil, obviously, mm-hmm. because there's tie ins with that terrible film version, <laughs> oh, yeah, flag. so the ownership of that might be a bit more questionable and it might be the kind of thing that Disney could buy, I'd guess. But mm-hmm. I don't know, I is don't want them to appear. That's the problem because it's in limbo, isn't it? I'm a bit scared that Disney might just rip them away from Netflix and take them. But I think Netflix produ- may put the money up front to produce them, so I think that they get first. Possibly. I mean, I, I wouldn't claim to have the knowledge on that one, unfortunately. It's going to be a messy divorce. All right. So <laughs> the first one, Daredevil, um, is obviously, as Tom said, a really first came to public eye in a really bad movie. By Ben Affleck, and was it Colin Farrell? as a really comical bullseye that I could yeah. text, obviously. Through Michael Clark Duncan, damn good kingpin. I have that. And um, yeah, but, yeah. And then there's that chick from Alias, uh, Jennifer Gardner. She was pretty decent. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. she got the, she got the gig because she was married to Ben Affleck, wasn't she? Yeah. Electric, Electra and Ben Affleck, Ugh, Batman. Um, uh, so Daredevil um, basically it's uh, played by Charlie oh no my bro, Charlie Cox um, he's a pretty good actor I love the Foggy Nelson um, he's a blind lawyer um, by Dave Matt Murdock um, he's blinded as a child he's got heightened senses and he spends his evening being Batman I mean Daredevil um Basically, defending Hell's Kitchen, which is basically our version of Brixton, or maybe East London to English viewers. Uh, it's basically a shit off. Um, and it's played, uh, there's a crime lord called Wolfskin Fisk. Um, what's the name of the actor? Dun, 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 dun. I don't think it's that, no. <laughs> mm, I can't remember. My brain has. Farted. Uh, he's fantastic. Um, Let me look it up. Yeah. You can tell how last how thrown together this episode was. <laughs> okay, it's Toby Lennon Moore. No, it's not. 
Vincent D'Onfrio. Yeah. Vincent D'Onfrio. Oh, nice. See, the thing is, he's a really good kingpin, like Michael Clark Duncan, so I'm not going to compare the two. But season two missed him. Then season... I think everyone has watched that. <laughs> He was I'm, just thinking, I'm, just, I'm just smashing through this at this point because everyone's seen these shows. So, like, season two, I think the Punisher thing was fun, but I always felt like season three was better with uh, the Kim Pim being back in, and I do love me some Bullseye. And they found a different way in on that. I just love Foggy. I love... Um, what's her name? Oh, see, I am not ready for this. Karen Pay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Karen Page is a really good actress and she appears in everything. She's in True Blood. Yes, she does exactly right. She's a very good actress. And Rosie Dawson, who appears... I'm going to... I've got a bone to pick about Rosie Dawson. That's Claire Temple. Because she's in every sodden series of the Netflix original. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy about... I, Daredevil's my favourite. I think Jessica Jones may be better though. I would argue. But I don't... They're the top two. I think everyone tends to agree Jessica Jones and Daredevil are the best two of the uh, DMC. I mean, I've, I've got to be honest, I've never watched Daredevil, Daredevil as a TV series because I watched that film. You need to go I, watch. I knew, I knew the comic book a little bit before I watched the film and I was so devastated by <laughs> The film that I thought, well, maybe it's just a character you can't really put on screen well. You so don't. okay, um, I'm gonna out myself here. I enjoyed the film. <laughs> okay, and I loved the TV series. I, I absolutely adored the TV series, <laughs> but I am someone who was looking for Daredevil comic books in the corner shop when I was a kid. Uh, yeah. That run is so good. Which are you? Um, I remember reading Michael Brian Michael Bendis and uh, Drew Baker. Um, they just went on a massive run for like seven, eight years of just amazing writers coming onto that book. I mean, when it good comes God. down to it, like what we're looking at when we look at Daredevil is we're looking at a history that's now been very much messed with in the comic books. Mm. So, yeah. Because Marvel uh, loves rebooting everything and doing another massive crossover that changes everything again. That's why I got out of comic books because I was getting exhausted. Nothing meant anything anymore because here's the next, literally, at some, one point they were taking the Mickey because it was like literally the next event would start after the last one and you wouldn't have the time to get used to the new status quo. And yeah. It got annoying very quickly. Um, Jessica Jones is another one. It's the female alcoholic one. Um, Investigator. Investigator, thank you. Um, Christian Ritter. Christian Ritter. Um, she's perfect. And obviously the first season is really good because it's about abusive ex-boyfriend. Um, it's basically what I like to think of um, David Tennant's 10th Doctor staying on Earth turned into. He killed Rose Tyler and ended up being an arsehole. Um He's just really because he's got, he's got his doctor voice. He's got his doctor voice on his English accent. Yeah. And on this. David, David Tennant is like playing the purple man. Yeah, purple man. Um, it's a really strong first season, and it's got um, yeah, it's it's a really strong. She's not she's fraud. She's an alcoholic. Um, she's funny. Um. And Luke Cage, it's the first time we see Mike Coulter as Luke Cage as well, and I was really impressed by him in the first season. Mm-hmm. Um, second and third season, people don't tend to like so much. It's a bit weaker, but it's still solid. You know? It's solid because it's got a good cast. Yeah, and good writers, and they know what they're doing with it. Like yeah. Daredevil, it's just, it holds the line. That's very good. Um, well, for, uh, I mean, for me, it's made by the fact that David Tennant is the bad guy in it. On a personal uh, level, you had to kill him off, though. You couldn't. You could have kept him around for another season, maybe. No, yeah, I've also got to say, like that character choice is a really, really tough one to pull off. Marvel Comics, like they messed up both with Jessica Jones and with the Purple Man. The Purple Man yeah. was never set out properly as being as 
incredibly scary as that power set would give you. No, that's where Bendis comes David into David Tennant did it perfectly and injected menace into it, which hadn't existed before. Jessica. Huh? Jessica. Sorry. I always hear the word Jessica now. It's Jessica. Yeah. Like, and Jessica herself as well, in the comics, had to have a couple of retries and retcons being applied to her. And it was actually the retcon that was for the Netflix universe that gave her a proper proper badass character. Yeah. Before that, she was kind of the housewife who used to be a superhero. Yeah. The problem is, Rosio Dalton turns up again. And because the thing is, all these seasons that we're talking about all spread out different orders because they didn't do them one, two, three, one, two, three. So our timeline is all over the place. I'm not even going to do the timeline because we'll be here until Christmas. Um, Luke Cage um, is a really good. I love the. Uh, I love all the intro music of these shows, but especially because this is a black cast. Um, Coulter is um, amazing, um, and it's got that Shaft style seventies Harlem music going on really sort of putting the branding on it yeah it's fantastic and it's a good cast i do think season one it makes a mistake you get rid of the best bad guy halfway through the season is a mistake one problem with luke cage is he's invulnerable so it takes a lot to make him feel vulnerable the cast is just fantastic and funny and but i felt that the politician main bad guy wasn't great for the rest of season one. Season two solid again. Um, but I think it gets shafted. It gets forgotten about because of um, Jessica Jones and, and Daredevil, I think. In my opinion. It's very good. It only got two seasons. Um, but I'm, um, I get, we get to Iron Fist, which is shit. So I'm just going to ignore Iron Fist because I didn't watch season two of this. Season one was laughably bad. It's about a guy with a fist. more the same. Oh, good to hear. Um, it's basically about a guy with a fist, um, mar- martial arts, mystical temple stuff, and it's just boring. It's just uh-huh. proper naff. The actors are fine. Um, who is the main actor for this one? Finn Jones, who's from Game of Thrones and stuff like that. He's okay. But they're more interested in the boardroom stuff, which is never the most interesting. And really, the fight scenes are too cut. They keep cutting angles, so you can't really see them do the kung fu. Um, it was better. In, I've heard season two is marginally better with Luke Cage, like the heroes of for higher thing from the comics. But I this is the only one where I didn't finish the season, all the seasons, because I tapped out halfway through season one. Is it, my friend just said, don't keep going. It's terrible. And um, what do you guys think of Iron Fist? Never seen it, never going to. Yeah, stay away from it. You can't get back those hours, mate. Okay, so um, this is going to be, like, I, I'm going to delve into this a little bit more whenever I get to my part in the evening. But basically, Iron Fist suffered from one thing being shoehorned in into the wrong place because people were afraid of a backlash and so into a story which is quintessentially about the rich white boy going and find out that going and finding out that the world is a bigger place than him but in a way which is very sort of whitewashing and white friendly because he turns out to be the iron fist he turns out to be the special one yeah it is a fantasy story and from the off they tried to shoehorn in this more flawed, less heroic, whinier Daniel Rand mm. and tried to make everyone who was underrepresented stronger around him. Mm. And I can see why they were trying to do it. I understand it. Just that you were already stuck making an Iron Fist series because you had 
all of the rest of them together ready to go. It had been really successful. The defenders was going to have to happen. It That's well, we can talk about that on, at the end, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the Defenders is a crossover, which I was really excited for when they originally announced what they were going to do with it. And then um, it was just okay. I felt like they could have cut this down. One problem I've had with all these shows is they could have done 10 episodes instead of 13. Um, I felt like if they'd done eight seasons, eight episode seasons, every series has got that lag in the middle. And even with eight episodes, the Defenders feels slow. Uh, it's obviously great to see them all together. And it all come together. I, I think just, season one of Jessica Jones should have been 60 episodes. Fair play. But I feel like um, they could have definitely cut a few of these shows down to 10 episodes at least to get rid of the middle. Because a lot of the shows tend to suffer from that middle drag where it's a bit too too many. I think 10 is a sweet spot for a good show. It's punchy. And then there's The Punisher, uh, who debuted in episode um, season two of Daredevil, played by everyone's favorite bastard from The Walking Dead, Shane. Um, I can't remember his name. I am so well prepared today. Wolf? No. Frank Bruffnell? Anyone want to help me out here with a name? Hang on. Some dude from John Baffnell. Okay, Shane, who got shot way too early in season two of the war. Yeah, John like, Burnfell. But John Burnfell. And that's a good show. Again, I like I didn't like the films before they brought this character to the, to the screen. But it did a good job. Um, it was very violent. Very funny. He brought a bit of humour to the, the, the character. I'm fortunately really weak villains though. And I'm not being rude. I don't really care about American military. Um, so I find it when they go into the whole American military thing, very, very boring. I thought Ben Barnes was great in it though, Jigsaw. Yeah. I just felt... I don't know. Maybe it's a show too far. Because there was plans of a Blade TV show with Netflix before it all came down at Moon Knight. They were going to do that, which Disney Plus now has. But what do you think led to the interest in the Netflix shows failing? Also, are. Well, should we save that for your, your thing? Because we spoke about this beforehand. Should we save it for your bit at the end and discuss why? Yeah, we leave it. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay, so that's me. I've just decided I should talk about the Marvel stuff. Started well, went a bit of a wet fart at the end, unfortunately. It just died off. Once you knew they all cancelled, it really dampened the excitement of watching a new season. It was a bit comical. That last 18 months, it all just went down. I, I generally loved it, so that's me done. Okay, Tom, you're up. Okay. Um, all right, so this week I'm going to talk about two shows that are connected because they are essentially one show but under two different names, if that makes sense. Season two has a different name to season one. So um, the first series was called The Young Pope. You guys heard of this? No. I thought you were talking about the two popes. <laughs> no, 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 that, that's another show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the young pope is the story of well it's quite an odd story it's um directed by a guy called paolo sorrentino mm. who is an italian very good but mainly uh mainly does films in italy he's not that well known in the rest of the world mm. but he's very highly rated mm. and it's the story of um the pope francis the first has died and it's the election of a new pope, and they le- elect someone who's very young, so he, and American. He's played by Jude Law. Oh, uh, yeah, Jude Law is fantastic in this. This is he. I mean, it's a weird show, but Jude Law carries this whole thing. It's beautiful. And then, so obviously, you're thinking, okay, it's about that, but then it's a lot about the politics of the Vatican, and 
people winding each other up and how this new pope is basically going, fuck you, I'm not doing it your way, at almost every turn. Like uh, in one of the first episodes, he's, he chain smokes as well. So it's quite an odd thing. You've got a picture of the guy in the full paper robe smoking a fag in his office. It just, it's an int- it's a weird image, but it's good. Um, yes. As I say, it's a lot about the politics of how the other cardinals have kind of been used to things being a certain way. And suddenly this guy who takes the name Pope Pius the Thirteenth, his real name is Lenny, takes over. He's from New York. He, he's yeah, he kind of almost sounds like a gangster. <laughs> about to say he sounds like a New Yorker with a name like Lenny. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of, it's it's a very odd show, but it's filmed beautifully. And it jumps all over the place. But basically this guy Lenny, he's like he wants to bring back the mystery of the church. So in like his first episode, they're saying, oh, we need to do a um, like a big picture thing so that we can make plates and T-shirts and all this kind of stuff for you. And he goes, no, we're not going to do that. The crowds are not going to see my face. Mm. When I stand on St. Pete's and Peter's, when I stand on the balcony at the Basilica, I'm going to stand far enough back that I am in shadow. They are, the Pope will be a mystery. Because the people don't know who he is before. He's yeah. a he, yeah, he's got to the part of cardinal, but in all honesty, even as a lifelong Catholic, I couldn't point to any cardinal and say, "Oh yeah, that's him." The only put the only priest that I know, other than my uncle, who is a priest, is the Pope. It's they all the pope. old dudes. That's my problem. They all look the same. Well, you're not allowed to become the Pope until you pass the age of fifty. Well, that would explain that then. <laughs> That's that's part of the you have to I think you have to be between fifty and seventy nine, is the it's either fifty or sixty but I think it's fifty and seventy nine, is the official line. So you because they don't think you've got enough world experience before fifty, that and once you pa- and once you pass eighty, it's a rigorous job. You've had and to. They don't think you can do it. Mm. There there are exceptions, but I'm not going to go into that because it's canonical law and it's yeah it's tricky so i'm not Mm. going to go through those exceptions but anyway okay so basically this guy by being quite aloof is actually losing people the church are losing followers but there's a lot of rumors about this this pope as well that he somehow performed a miracle when he was a child Mm. and that kind of plays into it a bit and it's a very odd show and he it took some time for me to get into, but I really enjoyed it because Jude Law was so captivating. Some of the cast who were actors I'd never heard of before, mainly Italian actors, were brilliant. And I'm like, okay, you've got my attention. So anyway, basically, when you get to the last episode, spoiler alert, by the way, of the last episode of series one, which is called The Young Pope, he gives a speech at the Basilica in Venice. And at the end of the speech, he sees somebody who looks like someone he knows who shouldn't be there, and he collapses. And that's how the series ends. You've got no idea what happened. He's just hit the ground. Okay. So, leave it on. Series 2, which came out only a couple of months ago. I've just finished watching it, actually, today. I think I've got about five minutes left on the last episode. But... Pretty much, I know what's happening with it. Should have um, waited. Should have left you after those five minutes, dude. You could have just told us. We could have done this later. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I know what happens. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure I know what happens. You can so, um, it, so. I, I, I could make a pretty educated guess as to what's going to come, okay. but and I'll and I will double check that I'm right and confirm it in a second. But okay, I'll, I'll search that in a minute. But anyway, so the second series. You find out that it's nine months on from Pope Pius's collapse. He's had multiple heart surgeries and nothing has worked. He's been in a coma for nine months. And medical science is saying there is no way this man comes back. We're literally keeping him alive. He will not he will not return. So the Secretary of State for the Vatican, who is one of the cardinals. And he's like, he's he's the main manipulator. He moves. He's kind of like the way that the cogs move in the Vatican, and kept coming up against the new pope. 
they decide that they need to elect a new pope, even though Pope Pius is still technically alive, there's no way he'll ever wake up again, so they decide that they're going to do that. They, This guy, Voyello, who is the Secretary of State, wants to be Pope himself, but he's not popular enough. And he's losing the vote in the conclave. So he then gets all of his people and a couple of other people to vote for somebody who he thinks will be an absolute patsy. A guy who's like the most nondescript cardinal of the lot. And he gets made Pope. But this guy then realises the power that he's got and turns out to be a right hardcore. He goes, right, you know what? We don't need money. We don't. Need... He takes the name of Francis II, basically says he's going to sell all of the church assets. We can all live in poverty. We don't need this. And he ends up being um, taken out. Yeah. So basically this guy, Viola, has him quietly removed. And they need to get a new they need to get a new pope, but they need one that is this guy Viola knows that he won't get it, so he has to find someone who he can work with. Mm. And the person who came second in the voting is a guy called um, Maddox, who is a English he's a sir, he's a, he's got like country estates and all this stuff, and he never ever comes to Conclave, ever. He's a complete he's an English eccentric of the of the aristocracy, played by John Malkovich. Very interesting. Malkovich, my God, what a performance! So so good. He plays. He plays it very much. He gets the whole aristocracy thing. I was slightly worried about Malkovich playing this role because I remember watching a film many years ago, The Man in the Iron Mask. Mm. Which had Jeremy Irons, Gerard Depardieu, John Malkovich, Leo DiCaprio, Gabriel Byrne. Um, Leo DiCaprio can't do anything but an American accent, really. But all the other cast were doing either French or British accents. Apart from Malkovich, went American. And so I just assumed that he didn't have the capability. I knew he could do Russian, because I've seen him in a film called Rounders, where he plays a yep. psychotic Russian. <laughs> So I knew he could do that. <laughs> but no, he actually can do a really, really good British accent. <clears throat> anyway, he basically gets talked into becoming the new Pope. Mm. Becomes uh, Pope John Paul III. Okay. And he, basically, the whole point is, this guy has espoused a thing called the middle way. So he's kind of a centrist. He should keep both sides of the the people happy. And he's, he's very good, but he's also a recovering drug addict, so there's lots of things going on. And the second half of the series, first half is kind of him being elected. And then... <clears throat> one thing, I love I love the character that Malkovich plays because there's a bit where, you know, in the Conclave, you know, all the Cardinals vote. And then they announce how many votes were for each person. And he gets 168 votes, and there's one vote for some random Cardinal. And all of the Cardinals are trying to work out who the hell voted for him. We were going to have a unanimous victory. And towards the end of the series, um, John Paul III admits it was him who voted for someone else. And I just quite like that. <laughs> he also okay. has um, a really strange meeting with Sharon Stone, playing herself. Does she open her legs like a basic instinct? That's what I want to know. Well, no that's exactly the joke they go with. She comes in, sits oh, down, and said, for, the sake, for my sake, would you please refrain from crossing and uncrossing your legs during this interview? Is the only <laughs> thing the Pope says to her. <laughs> and it's just like, yes, perfect. Love it. <laughs> um, it does one of these things that I don't like where it's sometimes a little bit too aware of itself. Mm. Because there's a point where the Pope has just, John Margaret has just become Pope. And he's chatting to a nun, like just very matter of factly and she goes oh you remind me of one of my favorite actors john malkovich and it's like yeah, there was no need for that but <clears throat> they only did it the once and i can sort of let that go mm. but I, I don't like when they do things like that unless it's a proper nod nod and there's a good reason for it like making a doctor who reference inside another show with david tennant in it or something you yeah, know yeah, yeah. okay screw you okay <laughs> but 
So yeah, the second half of the series is about the fact that out of nowhere, uh, Lenny wakes up. And it's about him kind of, he slowly, quiet, slowly but surely he comes back to the Vatican and he and Pope John Paul III basically come to an agreement where Lenny pretends that he hasn't woken up and John Paul will work with him and the two of them will work together. Because essentially people think that Lenny's a saint, uh, a saint because people are attributing miracles to him and shit like that. And he performs one during the show as well. It's very odd. He, he almost like, like he is a saint. He's able to do amazing things. Like keeping people alive, shit like that. When they should die. But it always seems to take a lot out of him. So he's supposed to be quite young. He's supposed to be like early 50s. And at the end of the series, basically, um, John Malkovich character goes, you know what? I need to be brave enough to say, I don't want to do this job. I'm retiring. There's a, The Pope before me is alive again. I'm giving him the job back. So Lenny returns to the papacy, but a very different version of him. So he comes out on the balcony and he says, and he talks about love and all this stuff. And he basically espouses the same view of, as John Malkovich's character. And then goes out into the square and starts hugging everybody. Whereas before he'd been this aloof, the Pope should be and shouldn't be seen. He's completely changed his attitude and he brings lots of people together. And then he's walking back into St. Paul's and he just suddenly collapses again. And this time I'm pretty sure he's dead. I haven't okay. definitely known. I think they were just checking him at the. So I think performing the miracles and doing what he's done has taken it out of him. He's come back for what he needed to do and now boom, he's gone. And yeah. I, my guess would be that they. The character of Voyello, who was the, the state Secretary of State, who wasn't liked, has changed a lot in the last series where he's been far more helpful, far less combative, but still doing good things. So I think he will be... I think, the, I think they'll end it with him being elected as Pope, so him getting his heart's desire as well, I think. The other thing that I absolutely love, it's the last thing I'm going to say on this series, is the, the opening to it is a lot of very, very attractive nuns dancing provocatively to a flashing crucifix, which is an awesome opening to a TV show. Okay. Right. Just uh, as a visual... Yeah, I mean, obviously, as a Catholic, I felt scandalised in every way possible, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, they're attractive. <laughs> uh, where can we watch this show, Tom? It was made by HBO. It is... I know you're yeah. going to put up your cross as a, the devil. It's on Sky Atlantic. But it was made by HBO, so I'm sure you'd be able to find a way of getting it without giving money to... So... I, felt, I felt like I was going to make a little altar boys joke, but I thought, no, I'm going <laughs> to be above that. Am I Take above the that? Run. Take the high Yes, run. I am. I'm above <laughs> that. I was going to make one about his 80-year-olds. That's when they haven't got the energy to chase older boys, but I wasn't going to. Well, I've done it now. But honestly, if you're interested in this show, they do not shy away from the issues of paedophilia in the church and homosexuality in the church at all. It does seem they, to happen a lot in the church for some reason. Yeah. And I'm not saying all priests. No, it just they, seems they, to happen, it does happen a lot. Yeah. It's kind of scary. And I know, trust me, I'm not blaming priests. I'm just fairly like the bad ones stick out of we're not going to get into that. Well, part, well part, no, part of the problem was many, many, many years ago, and we're talking a long time back, if you had a child, a male child, who was either considered to be the simple one or had what was in those days considered to be unnatural taste, so basically homosexual, they yeah. sent you to the priesthood. Yeah. Because they thought that you would, they'd force you into a life of celibacy. So that your unnatural things didn't happen. But obviously, human beings are human beings. Human nature is human nature. And even though we obviously would never condone the shit that goes on, that's why it happened. That's mm. why it does happen. Also, you put somebody in a position of power, and priests have an amazing amount of power over their congregation. It's I an aphrodisiac. Whether you like it or not, it's a... I think, but I think a lot of people think all Christians support... <clears throat> type of behavior i think no, a lot of think. all christians i think most every christian i've ever spoken to is like no 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 no. um they've got nothing against homosexuality or but they also don't defend the priests that get caught they're like they're horrified yeah, they, it's, it's horrible it's like it's the same as say if you say that all catholics you use catholic i'm a catholic 
have no problem with paedophilic, paedophilic priests. That's like saying every single Muslim is a terrorist. It's no, all priests. It's, 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 it's so perfect. so I mean, untrue, that... it's unbelievable. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and, uh, by the yeah. way, I'm not suggesting that all Muslims are terrorists. I'm no. the exact opposite. I'd say 99.9% of both of those religions have people who are quite moderate. Same with Christians and uh, yeah. other religions. It's, it's just, just the, people what? use it as people find one negative thing and decide to make that the whole thing. Hello, yeah, Dave. Yeah, basically, don't generalize, don't stereotype. Exactly. Yeah. Every single ge- yeah. generalization is wrong. Yeah, we're looking at you, Daily Mail. Including, the, always... including that sweeping statement by Dan. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I'm generally sick and tired. I hate the Daily Mail because my mum used to read it and it always used to attack everything I liked with, without doing research. Video games are bad for you. Grand Theft Auto isn't for kids, but then again, that's the parents' fault, but they never point that out for buying the game. You know, all these things, like you said about Muslims, unfortunately, they always bang Muslims are evil when they're not. Yeah. Well, good. Well, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could we could get into this rabbit hole for hours and hours and hours. Let's dig ourselves out yeah. of it. Let's, I'm just let's I'm just going to talk gonna, about TV. I'm just going to say one thing. A good friend of mine and Dan's is currently suing one of the um, writers for the Daily Mail. So good. I hope he takes his house and everything else associated. Uh, it's a woman who he's going after, but yeah. <laughs> Doesn't matter if she's been a B word, she gets it. I'm sorry. Uh, defamation, defamation yeah, of character. We'll, 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 we'll leave, we'll leave that there as well. Yes. Yeah. We're not, we're not, we're not going to go any further into that because I don't want to damage his case in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> no, we just, we just keep going. Anyway, Dan, your turn. Quickly before it all goes wrong. So, um, I actually wanted to kind of skirt around a political subject myself today. Um. I wanted to talk about superhero TV shows, specifically uh, ensemble superhero TV shows. Okay. Um, I've been a I've been a long time fan um, of any any comic I could get my hands on. To be honest, there wasn't a lot of access to DC comics, so I grew up more in the Marvel vein. But once I got access to DC, I was into that as well, and with 2000 AD as well. and Even before all those, like, really, really young, I was always a Beano and a Dandy kid. I, I always wanted to have them. Um, and so as superhero TV shows and ensemble superhero TV shows have started coming out, I've obviously been interested in everything. I've wanted to give everything a shot. I've seen quite a bit of it. And I've noticed... Like, there's sort of two categories, and one of them's a lot better than the other. Okay. And sometimes a show will switch from one category to the other. Hmm. So, the, in category one is the one where we have a lot of. Uh, preaching (laughs) a lot of what would seem to be completely sort of superfluous exposition or forcing in social issues where we could probably just understand that that's what's happening anyway but it's like it's suddenly in the middle of this really serious intense thriller show it's all been dumbed down to the level of five year old yeah we feel like the cast should turn to the camera and say do you get it yet and then turn back yeah. and continue yeah. mm. and it, over and over this is happening and it's to different extents in different places one of the worst for it and I'm really sorry to say it because otherwise we're talking about some nice performances from a cast. We're talking about what could be a really interesting story and a really interesting take on the characters. Cloak and Dagger. Ah, uh, Disney Plus. It really, it every so often it just turned into this, the more you know. Hold on. In... Didn't they cross over? Sorry to interrupt you, Tom, um, Dan. They crossed over with the other Marvel show I need to watch, Runaways. Ah, is it good? Cloak and Dagger. 
um, if if you can get past this this level of what I'm talking about, if you're able to just handle that and sort of get past it, then it's it's all right. Okay. It's just all right, <laughs> and it. I don't want to say anything bad about the actors and actresses in it. It's. I don't know. Sometimes they're given a lot more to work with and then it's sort of folded back on itself and a lot of stuff stops making sense in an effort to go after, I think, spectacle and more chances for exposition. Mm. So, yeah, your character development's a little all over the place, so the cast actually have a pretty tough time of it. Okay. Um, Right. Uh, I couldn't get past halfway through the second season. I just had enough. I was really, really trying to get to the end of the season. Did they bang on more about it in season two? Did they increase what annoyed you with it? Or is it just a general... You right. kept you're, going. you're trying to hold on to all the disjointed bits of things that have been thrown in so that there can be more preachiness and you're trying to make that part of the timeline and make sense and then have them get over those things but then keep having opportunities to bang on about it yeah and it's lazy the writing was lazy it was a quick grab at an audience to try and be preachy and the story suffers quite a lot for it which is unforgivable Mm. Um, like to put it up against something else, right? Uh, maybe other people won't actually agree with me, but I absolutely adored Doom Patrol. Sorry, what? Doom Patrol. Don't know it. Oh uh, uh, yeah, I've heard about this. Is initially Doom Patrol was this um DC comic book, which was actually the thing that the X Men ripped off. It was that group of misfits brought together by eccentric genius rich dude who somehow end up continuously saving the world even though they're battling all of their own demons. Stanley, you even bastard. It, Brendan Fraser's in it as a dude who's basically a robot. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's an absolute carnival ride of while tripping on DMT kind of show. It's ridiculous. I I would half expect that someone just gave Ross Noble all of the characters and <laughs> right, so what <laughs> you know what I mean? Um it's mm. absolutely ridiculous. Um it's a show where the, the main villain is like he is so OP and at the same time so pathetic <laughs> and they lean into it oh. and all of the things about diversity and all of the things about inclusion and all of the things about being preachy they're, they're all part of this absolute crazy spectacle world there's more reason for them you can still see it happen but it's a lot more forgivable because it, makes, it sense. makes sense in the context. It's not jarring mm. you out of what's actually going on. The only thing which might jar you out of what's going on is going, so hang on, there's an entire street which is a person. <laughs> How did That's... that town get sucked into a goat? I can see mm. why you would be a fan of this show, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's really well done. Um, it's completely mental. There, it's filled with heart-wrenching moments. It's filled with chaos and scary and jeopardy. And at the end of it, you still don't know what the fuck's going on, but in a good way. Mm. Um, it's a, that is it's done really well. The story's put first. It's the other type of hero show like Ensemble Hero Show, the story is put first, everything else has to work around it. Hmm. Um, um, what's yeah. your thoughts? Have you, are you watching Stargirl? Because DC have a lot of shows on just on their own. Do you watch any of the Arrowverse, Supergirl, The Flash, Runaways from Marvel? I've, 
I've seen a lot of them. Um, not you all, of, all of them, but yeah, a good portion. So, what's your favourites? Which ones do you think lead? Um, in terms of the ensemble cast ones, I mean, Flash is always going to be one which has stood out for many seasons. Mm. It was just it was done really, really well. Um, later seasons of Arrow, the early seasons of Arrow suffer. Um, but the later seasons, even as they get into more of a sort of a diversity based storyline, they do it really well. And I really enjoyed that. Supergirl. Yeah. Meh. There's, there's nothing terribly wrong about it, but I'm 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 really struggling to even be bothered watching the next thing. It's kind of it's kind of like a candy one. It's just it's there. It's not offensive. You can watch it. Mm. But, but it's Legend of Tomorrow. Is... I really enjoyed Legend of Tomorrow. That's meant to be really good. Uh, that we told was... Tom that Stargo is awful though. We told... <laughs> it's good to stay away from Stargo. Yeah, and okay. I have followed that advice. Yeah, me too. He gets um, it back once in a while. Runaways is actually not bad. Runaways is worth it. It's also a fantastic that. comic series as well. Yes, I love that comic series so much. Um, so good. I want to watch it on Disney+. Plus. It, it okay. does diverge from the comic series, yes. um, but it, it does so in, in a way which is kind of cool. Mm. Um. Because I noticed that Alex is still with the group, so obviously I'm guessing they have diverged from the books a bit. Because he's um, spoilers. A, I know. Don't tell me if it happens in the show, but in the comics, he's a bit of a prick and he turns on the team. Really um, first well, run. I'm the not going to say anything, um, yeah. but I am I'm, say it's well worth watching. Yeah. Um, what is not worth watching is Titans. It'll keep on offering you hope and then snatching it away. I was about to watch that. It'll keep on offering you hope that it's turning into a really good series and then it'll snatch it away. That's your new t-shirt design if we ever get to merchandise. Um, don't really, if my opinion means anything, just uh, don't waste the hours. Um... I'm sorry to all the people who put in a lot of really good work on it because there are parts of it which are done really well. Um, the post-production is excellent. The uh, camera work in it is absolutely excellent. The way they're doing the cinematography and the editing is absolutely great. Hmm. But this is the one where the story has entirely been built around the need to be just driving points home that are just over and over again political point, political point, political point, political point. Mm. And so, just there are so many good performances ruined by it. There's so many good options of things that could happen ruined by it. Uh, there's one thing I wanted to ask you because obviously. In the movies, Marvel whipped DC every time in terms of like success. I have noticed a lot of Marvel shows don't last very long because we discussed the Netflix stuff earlier. DC seems to be doing quite well with its range of TV shows, at least. What do you? Why do you think Marvel stuff gets cancelled so much? Because you can find it in humans uh, outside of Runaways and Agents of Shield. They don't seem to last very long. Well, why do you? Think I'll, Netflix... give you I'll give you it straight up. Like. Okay straight up DC found a better way to integrate this whole new you must be part of the movement you must be in the zeitgeist you must be in the Overton window they found better ways to incorporate that um, Marvel suffered by basically all at the same time trying to put a whole spin on everything that it did from comics through TV through movies, it tried to implement all at the same time. Try to put them all um, together in a universe. DC's movies okay. have a real leg up in all of this, in that they have Wonder Woman. 
and Wonder Woman is an absolutely beloved character who was portrayed really well, and you can't really doubt that she was a really, really strong female role model. I mean, what I like I, about DC recently is like they're not copying Marvel so be... much now. They're trying not to tie everything into one universe. Now, DC are trying to be a bit looser with their community. Yeah. Continuity, yeah. which is good because the movies are being really good lately because they're not so fixated on tying everything into ongoing plot. And sometimes I think it's even exactly. the Marvel shows, they keep trying to tie everything into the big universe. It's too complicated. If, if you had, for example, right, I'm just going to say a complete, like, the the way DC have done things, they have they have spread out their primary sources for all the different levels of um, like inclusion and diversity and all sorts of things that are really quite important. Um, they have they've taken one end of it with the Doom Patrol stuff. They've used that. That's a vehicle basically to develop Cyborg. Mm. Cyborg is this character who's going to leave that Doom Patrol stuff behind as being his early years and then is going to be fleshed out into a fully fledged superhero and is going to go into the movie universe. Mm. And that's awesome. They need to fix his CGI because they haven't gotten it right yet in the movie or the TV show. (laughs) But um, when they do, he will be fantastic. Um, when it comes to the stuff to do with Marvel's TV shows, they've actually had a lot of success. Hmm. And the everybody getting really scared about political leanings, we have to cancel everything and try again, was what caught the Netflix lot. They made this sort of hasty attempt to make it all make sense and work by basically Mm. neutering Iron Fist and when that didn't work and they got um, backlash for that they tried to go back in the other direction a little bit Um, Mm. they were called out again by another group of people and were told that they'd play on them and so they cancelled everything it was just fear pandering and oh we're going to lose business if we and (laughs) I don't know all of the ins and outs of that, so I can't really comment further than that. One day it will come out. And the the thing that I'm thinking about is Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Because Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has just been a powerhouse. It kind of faded into the background, but it's basically become the Marvel version of Smallville. Mm. And it has really, really, like in later series, it has suffered just the same as everything else has from a little bit too much preachiness, a little bit too much shoehorning, but it had a really good base to start off from. And whereas in other places, the main sort of, everything has a, a, a male white lead kind of problem. Hmm which had been plaguing everything because there was just, just, it was everything. Everything had it. This male white lead was sort of universally beloved in uh, Coulson. Yeah. Coulson was just taken on by everybody. Everybody loves Coulson. They adopted him into so the heart. So skipped that sort of issue and it also had a really, really super strong cast other than that and a really good story to build off of. So... I don't know. I think I think that's probably the most successful of the Marvel TV things. Definitely. Well, we can always... Sorry? No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So, with the movies, like, just to go back to a point you were making before, with, like, trying to put everything into the one continuity, I think that's literally the mistake that was made with Captain Marvel. Yeah. Um, everything else... Um, that I have ever had an issue with with Marvel has been a marketing issue. Okay. 
um, apart from one thing in Black Panther, which was, I'm sorry if you loved the music, I hated it. Okay. Specifically the bit where they're coming in in the, in the ship through the mirage into Wakanda for the first time. It really, really got to me. It jarred me horribly, and I just I couldn't forgive them for that. But other than that, um, like Captain Marvel had this possibility to be a, you know, a Guardians of the Galaxy introduced phase four. Let's give it a proper build up. Let's introduce Carol Danvers the way she was supposed to be introduced. This is one of the most important characters in the Marvel Universe let's give her a properly fleshed out story. But instead, they just sort of rushed it and then hailed it as a really big success when it really wasn't. Like, it was a step that they felt they had to take, yes, and they took that step. So in that case, yes, it was a success, but it took away from... Like Endgame. Mm. Her being included in Endgame as a powerhouse who could go toe to toe with Thanos as a symbol of, I don't know, progressiveness. Oh, uh, the bit with all the women just is too it's too on the nose for me. There's a bit. Uh, We're no, coming no, off. Top. Hang on, hang on though. Every single woman I know who has watched that film. Yeah emotionally connects with that moment. Oh, I get it. But it's a bit obvious. You could have done it more subtly. It could, it could have been done a bit more subtly, but at the same time, but, like I have no problem with that kind of grandstanding in a comic book movie. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, have, I have no issue with that. Um, the first time I saw it, it jarred me a little bit as well, but that's more because I'm such a Spider-Man fan, and I was like, guys! <laughs> but they have built up to it over time, like, at least Marvel have been putting that building blocks there, and they had strong female characters before. It's not like they've tried to interject it. But anyway, we've got to wrap this up, because it's now an hour. We've had a good run. <laughs> no, right. Fair. We can always come back to this. No, it's okay. Um, we can always come back to this though we might have to because I've got other plans in a couple of weeks time for more superhero stuff so we can always come back or we could just do a big special one day on all the superhero shows and just do the whole lot I think we probably should I think yeah. I'll probably sit that one out boy okay well Troy if we go get Troy me and Dan and Troy will just talk for four hours about superheroes yeah. don't get yeah. me wrong I love superhero stuff but I don't watch enough of it that's, that's going to be a three and a half, four hour long podcast, though, isn't it? It'll be good, though. But we need to, we've got to crack that one open. Maybe 20, the first one of 2021, we'll crack that one open. Uh, yep. Yeah. All right. Definitely. Okay. So, anyway, so next week is if we can find the key to the cupboard, which we have got to in, we will, we will get to the Ashes to Ashes um, special. Dan will be going in the cupboard next week instead. Yeah, take his place. Yeah. I, I, I made an error in judgment. No, it's okay. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really, really sorry about your billiards table, Ben. Yeah, I'm sorry, buddy, but you know how it is. And the tuba. Um... It's okay because in December you can lock me in the cupboard when true blood happens because I'm going to break something in and you have to stick me in the cupboard come true blood. It all works out in the end. Fair enough. We we'll have to find a way to stick Tom in the cupboard at some point. He'll do something bad, and then he will go in. No, oh, yeah, superhero that's a good one. <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you for listening. And um, that's um, yeah, I've completely screwed this up. I'm Ben. I'm Tom. I'm Dan. And thank you very much for listening. Have a great evening. Cheers. Bye. All right.